We'll get started. I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Brian Turner. Um, Brian has a background in, um, in, in a variety of areas of sociology, um, probably um, two real kind of key areas of health sociology and religious sociology, and it's a, a huge name in that field. So some of you might know that my uh, wife is a sociologist, and so uh, when she found out that Brian was working at ACU, she was extremely excited. Uh, excited a lot of your work in the past. So, uh, we're quite looking forward to this, and there are uh, a variety of us here in person, and then a, a whole bunch online. So, uh, oh. Oh, thank you for inviting me, and um, good to meet the institute um, uh, in person, as it were. Um, I suppose in in January, or, uh, I suppose by February or March, there was a whole series of invitations to sociologists and others to start writing about COVID-19 <coughs> and um, because sociology is often thought to be completely useless I, I thought this would be an opportunity to try to say something sensible about uh, COVID-19 but I wanted to do something slightly different because I knew that um, uh, most sociologists would be writing about things like social inequality the way in which COVID-19 has caught governments um, uh, with inadequate preparation for crises, <coughs> um, the crisis of um, people in old care uh, facilities and so forth. And I wanted to do something different and because I'm officially here employed as a sociologist of religion, I thought it would be some, worth trying to say something about uh, 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 COVID-19 from a sort of religious uh, point of view, <coughs> uh, particularly about the idea of theodicy, that is explanations of uh, um, God's role in uh, history and society and the vindication of a loving, caring God in the face of um, um, dreadful catastrophe. Uh, my other interests have been to try to explain uh, what we mean by successful societies and I sort of approach that from the perspective of um, um, citizenship and human rights and alongside that I've been interested in issues about how, can, how we can measure or even talk about uh, the happiness of individuals. And I think all of these interests are things shared not only by psychology and sociology but generally by humanities and social science. I suppose my starting point is to some extent <coughs> um, human beings are not interested solely in the brute facts of um, uh, difficulties, catastrophes, um, social organisation and so forth. We want to know what the meaning of it is. And um, uh, sociologists like Max Weber describe human beings as meaning making and meaning searching or seeking um, creatures who are not uh, particularly or only interested in the factual description of events but want to know what, if anything, they, uh, they mean. What is the portent of it? why me, why now, why here, and, um, and so forth. And so that was my starting point. And um, uh, from there, I, I sort of got interested in the idea of catastrophe, um, which the, the original meaning of which was the denouement of a Greek tragedy, the final closing act. But by the 17th century, it came to mean the overthrowing of a social order or the overthrowing of a government. And so it seems to me that, <coughs> that um, COVID-19 uh, is a catastrophe in, um, well, hopefully it's not the denouement, uh, but it is certainly the overthrowing of many institutions that we've taken for granted. So secondly, um, I'm interested in what sociologists such as Anthony Giddens have been saying recently about COVID-19 um, and about climate change and so forth. And uh, Giddens and others have sort of said that COVID-19 has no precedent. There is nothing quite like this in human, modern human history. And I, I want to sort of challenge those assumptions. Um, and I got interested in the history both of plagues and catastrophes on the one hand and the history of, of theodicy on the other. And if we compare COVID-19 with 1348, which was the Black Death, 
I mean, estimates of human uh, fatalities in, that, in Europe in the time um, are often put at about 200 million people died of the Black Death. Um, secondly, um, plagues were countered by the growth of quarantine measures. So again, I don't think quarantining and social distancing is particularly new. Um, the Venetians invented it as a way of controlling shipping um, because they had, they'd had come to the conclusion that it was being carried by merchant ships coming into European ports. Um, thirdly, plagues had deep impacts on human consciousness, political theory, social arrangements and so forth. Um, the Black Death of the 14th century was followed by the Peasant Revolt and by measures taken by authorities to control rising wages, which seems quite the kind of modern situation because the uh, uh, peasantry had been depleted by these um, terrible le levels of, uh, uh, of um, uh, mortality, that uh, the cost and the shortage of labor was driving up expectations of rewards and payment on the part of peasantry. And an ordinance was brought in to control wages and to control social unrest. What followed was a peasant revolt and uh, people like John Ball, the Protestant preacher who invented or gave rise to the expression when Adam delved and Eve Span, who was then the gentleman and was locked up for preaching a classless society at the time. So what we're seeing at the moment with COVID-19 is mounting social and political unrest, particularly in America, uh, to some extent more recently in the United Kingdom, and less so in Australia, but I mean there have been demonstrations and um, some level of, of um, social unrest um, in, in Melbourne. Um, we've, seen, we've seen protests and um, uh, attacks on police in France and to a lesser extent in Germany and, and so forth. At the moment I have a grant, an ARC grant, which hasn't started yet for obvious reasons, but it's on um, <coughs> the far right in Australia. <coughs> and um, uh, citizenship, the role of intellectuals in providing um, ideologies or beliefs or um, insight into uh, uh, populism. <coughs> and, the, and the erosion of various forms of citizenship in giving rise to these sorts of outbursts. So towards the end of this paper, I might talk a little bit about <coughs> social media and online debates between a whole cluster of far-right uh, movements um, uh, who are, at least in the, in the American case, armed <coughs> and um, uh, uh, ready to um, cause more um, uh, distress and trouble. Um, if Trump wins and if Trump fails, um, there may well be an increased level of, um, of social unrest and, uh, and, and difficulties in, um, in America. We might discuss, or we may want to discuss, uh, whether it's the case that more authoritarian states such as South Korea, Japan, um, uh, China and so forth have had much greater success in controlling um, COVID-19 than the democracies, uh, where we've seen people asserting, well, not only their civil rights, but their human rights not to wear masks, uh, not to engage in social distancing and so forth. And um, uh, it may well, ironically or sadly, turn out that democracies have much greater difficulty uh, controlling plagues and catastrophes than might be the case for uh, places like China, Russia even taking into account the fact that they are probably under-reporting um, the level of, um, of, um, uh, of, of health difficulties and deaths and so forth. And the fourth thing I think which, um, and I'm not a medic, um, is that um, these, these infections hang around for a very long time. And I think expectations that will be through COVID-19 sometime next year with vaccine um, is um, hopelessly optimistic. So, for example, um, there was an outbreak of bubonic plague in Outer Mongolia this year. 
um, 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 announced by the uh, uh, World Health Organization. So the bubonic plague, which, is, which I started with, namely the Black Death, is still present in human populations, um, although uh, there are uh, good health ways of controlling it. So, what I, what I did in this short paper and what I've done in this much longer uh, paper is to trace the, um, the rise and fall of religious explanations of um, uh, plagues and catastrophes, starting with this idea of theodicy, um, which is any attempt to explain misfortune, catastrophe, difficulties by reference to the benevolence of God. And therefore, most of these theodicy explanations uh, saw the problem of, um, of catastrophe as to do with something to do with human um, evil or um, uh, human uh, misbehaviour. Um, I jump forward to the 18th century to where we get the word theodicy, which is from a German philosopher, Gertrud Leibniz, who um, explained the Lombardy floods, which had been fairly catastrophic, uh, by reference to um, what he called um, the most complete form of human existence, that we live in a world of the best and most complete set of possibilities, including plagues, infections, and so forth. And so Leibniz was kind of key <coughs> to the richness of uh, human and natural existence. And that, um, um, in a famous book on monadology, as he argued that existence is better than non-existence, and therefore that suffering the presence of plagues is part of this great complexity and richness of the world in which we live. Now, Leibniz, Leibniz's explanation came to a crashing end with the earthquake that destroyed um, uh, Lisbon in the late 18th century and sent a tsunami all the way to Southern Ireland. And um, Leibniz's explanation of, um, of human catastrophe was um, um, attacked by people like Voltaire who thought it was an absurdity. What I do in this paper, therefore, is to try to trace what I want to call the secularization of explanations of catastrophe, bad luck, and so on and so forth. And one of the most characteristic forms of um, explanation of un unanticipated crises in the period I'm talking about was the notion of the wheel of fortune. And of course, the wheel is controlled by a woman um, who is the <laughs> cause of um, um, human uh, disasters. She is blindfolded and turns this wheel and um, both, I mean, the good news is that both the rich and the poor can be um, affected by this um, wheel of fortune. Um, that was um, a, a popular sort of explanation of misfortune um, in, um, in human societies. I move forwards to the beginning of the Industrial Revolution and the work of William Blake, who um, was um, both a famous uh, writer of ballads and illustrations, but also a political force in his own right, uh, because the famous hymn or song, Jerusalem, is actually a sort of political uh, pamphlet as well as a piece of uh, uh, amazing poetry. And I, I, call these, I call this secular type of explanation a, a political theology of catastrophe. And um, in contemporary sociology, there is actually a kind of, or there has been a development of something that people call sociodices. And I suppose sociologists are famous for appalling English. So uh, a sociodice is a sort of secular version of a theodicy. And um, what I wanted to argue was that the origins of socialism is a sort of political theology of disaster, which explains why the world is a mess uh, because of um, class inequalities um, and deprivation caused by um, the rise of a brutal form of industrial capitalism. 
Um, so Blake's idea about dark satanic mills, in fact, is a sort of socialist theodicy of uh, what was wrong with Britain at the time. Following, I mean, he was very he was very interested in the French Revolution, for example. So when I use the word catastrophe, I'm thinking of both natural and social catastrophes, and why the two are connected, uh, namely that political unrest tends to follow natural disasters. Um, and I sort of come to a kind of um, conclusion in the 20th century with um, Auschwitz, um, in which um, you had a lot of um, uh, Jewish philosophers and theologians at the end of Auschwitz saying that this is really the end of um, the idea of a loving God. Um, you had uh, Jewish philosophers coming up with the idea of the death of God, which was taken up by a German the Protestant theologian, Bonhoeffer, who um, argued that after Auschwitz there was no sort of meaningful or rational explanation of, um, of um, uh, this level of human misery. Um, so let me talk about what I think seems to be going on at the moment. Um, my research ARC grant is called um, um, the far right in Australia, but I mean what's happened over the last 20 years is that I think the difference between left and right has more or less collapsed. And this ARC grant could be equally called the far left in Australia as it is called the far right. Um, and these two kind of interpretations um, tend to coincide. From the far right's point of view, um, the potential end of migration, of immigration, um, the um, closure of borders, um, the um, idea of a deep state um, that is out of control, um, have all become themes on the social media, um, in media outlets like Reddit or 4chan, uh, QAnon, which has been very much in the media recently. I mean, there is an online debate going on, um, which um, is very dense and um, sort of connected very much with um, the idea of, um, you know, the Washington swamp or the deep state, um, an overreaching um, um, a government. And I think in America, uh, the combination of individualism, federalism, populism, um, racism and so forth uh, has meant that trying to get a statewide or a nationwide effective policy has been very difficult to implement, particularly with Trump um, not only constantly contradicting himself but contradicting the science and um, um, giving, um, you know, strange messages about, you know, wearing masks or not wearing masks or um, if you drink enough disinfectant you can, uh, you know, sort of cope with it. And we often look back at the medieval period where they had those nose bags uh, full of herbs um, as a kind of medieval mask as something that was ridiculous. Um, ring a ring a roses, a pocket full of poses, a tissue, a tissue, we all fall down, is allegedly a sort of child um, um, a poem uh, that comes straight out of the Black Death, and the Ring of Ring of Roses is the the um, the appearance of the Disney's, and the pocket full of poses is the equivalent of our mask. So here again, I'm not sure that you know uh, that our century's attempt to cope with um, COVID-19 is much different from the pl plague, you know, which invented, as I've said, quarantine masks. Um, the rich moved it out to the countryside, um, as probably Australians have moved in large numbers to the Blue Mountains, I assume, to uh, cope with this, um, etc. Um, but what about religion? Um, I think what's interesting from my point of view is the extent of evangelical Christian support for Trump. Now, on the one hand, they tend to think that his personal life is not something to be, um, you know, welcomed or followed or celebrated by um, evangelical Christians, but they 
Um, they're committed to his um, anti-abortion policy, if, if it is what he actually believes. Um, his pro-Israeli uh, stance. Um, his wanting to make um, America a um, conservative great uh, uh, nation again. And so Trump has received lots of um, um, evangelical support, including quite extreme charismatic groups who think that this is the beginning of the second coming and that Israel will be the place where the second coming actually uh, takes place. Um, and the research I want to do on the far right is very much concerned with um, these endless online debates about fake news, uh, deep state theories, conspiracy theories and so forth. And um, the fact that much of this discussion, of course, is very, very difficult to um, control. So at the end of this paper, I sort of end with the idea that um, so, far, there's no, so far there is no consistent meaning attached to COVID-19 uh, from a normative, moral, theological point of view. And I may be wrong about this, and you know, this is a Catholic university, so we should know. It seems to me that the church has been remarkably silent about COVID-19. I mean, chaplains and priests have been at the forefront of hospital chaplaincies. Um, uh, the Pope has been, I think, kind of quiet about whether there is any theological meaning to this. And um, what I, and I end this paper by saying that uh, from a sociological point of view, modern societies tend to be characterised by very fragmented moral systems or very fragmented uh, religious systems. So no coherent message comes forward about COVID-19, apart from all these fragmented conspiracy theories um, and so forth. And um, uh, kind of, I mean, obviously racist uh, commentaries about um, a Chinese conspiracy to undermine um, the um, Western political system. And um, so far, I mean, we've obviously seen uh, very difficult circumstances in Britain, France, uh, Spain, and so forth. Um, and so, I mean, this, this paper and, and the thing that I sent round um, ended on, ends on a fairly pessimistic note that um, we don't seem to have clear implementable policies in the, in the democracies to get on top of this. And um, as an ex-Brit, I mean, I'm kind of amazed by the level of confusion in the UK about what measures ought to be adopted, including, you probably read that they, they sent most of the students back to universities, uh, put on parties and celebrations for them, and they all, most of them went down with COVID-19, and then they're locked up in dormitories. In, um, but since finishing it, I, I, I think there is a sort of potentially positive uniting um, moral view of the mess we're in. But I'm going to end there and see if you can guess what it is. So that's my talk. Um, probably a bit short, I don't know. <laughs>